The Tom Woods Show, episode 1947. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. Start your day like a true Tom Woods Show listener with the official coffee of the Tom Woods Show, Press House Coffee. They've got a wide variety of mouth-watering roasts, and it's the best coffee I've ever tasted. Take 20% off your first order at PressHouseCoffee.com slash Woods and use promo code Woods at checkout. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. I'm joined today by Janine Yunus. That name is not spelled the way you might think. It's J-E-N-I-N-Y-O-U-N-E-S. She is a criminal defense and civil liberties attorney who goes by Lefty Lockdown Skeptic on Twitter. You can actually follow her at Lefty Lockdowns 1. So Lefty Lockdowns and then the number one. As you can tell, she comes at this from a point of view that is different from that of most people who listen to this podcast, and that's what makes her interesting. So I think we have a lot to talk about. So Janine, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Tom. You are kind of a stranger to me, I guess. I mean, I've read quite a few things you've written on Twitter, but we've never met or talked before. So I want to just let you take a minute to tell people about your background and, and who you are and how you got in the middle of this like me. Sure. So I was a public defender in New York City for quite some time, almost a decade. You know, one of the reasons I was drawn to that job was I saw government abuse its power a lot. I wanted to protect the most vulnerable criminal defendants, indigent criminal defendants who are facing the power of the state. However, I identified mostly as a leftist for most of my life. And when COVID hit, I was sort of alone in my social circle, you know, around my colleagues and thinking that the government was not acting correctly, that this was a huge violation of civil liberties, that it was also, you know, from a leftist perspective, that it was impacting the poor the most, you know, parents of means could send their kids to private schools, but indigent or poor families couldn't do that. So it was, you know, poor children who are being deprived of an education. It's easier for the Zoom class to work at home, the upper middle class or middle class white collar workers, well, it was restaurant workers, a lot of blue collar workers put out of business. So I really objected to that. And I found myself more and more alone on the left. So I became more involved in fighting lockdowns. And I met people from other (laughs) sides of the political spectrum. And I ended up moving to Washington, D.C. to take a job with the New Civil Liberties Alliance, which is a civil liberties law organization, nonpartisan, nonpolitical. Okay. So you spent some time, as I did, in New York City. So I'd actually like to start there. I mean, I know we could start in March 2020. And I wonder if you probably have the same kind of story that a lot of us have, that in March, you know, nobody really knows what's going on. We just want to even without any mandates, we might just, using common sense, want to be cautious until we have a sense of what's happening. And that was exactly what, yeah, okay, you know what? That is the line we're going to do. <laughs> we are going to start that. <laughs> I was in New York City by, I think it was March 6th or 7th or 8th, right around the time when things were starting to get very dicey. That was just when I was heading home from a trip. Because I, I would go up to New York uh, every couple of months. I just love, I love the city. For the politics aside, I just love it. I love it culturally. I, lo- I have friends. I, I love the food. I, I love everything about it. And in fact, while I was up there, I went out of my way to go to Chinatown because I was tired of, of people treating the Chinese like second-class citizens because of the virus. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I couldn't have been more open-minded and, and whatever, but man, I timed that so interestingly <laughs> because I left at the last possible second before things really went crazy. So that month, I did wonder to myself about a couple of uh, events I had planned, whether I should attend and whether it made sense and so on. And so I was willing at the beginning, not necessarily to go along with everything the government wanted me to do, but I was willing to be a reasonable person who kept an open mind because you never know what we could be facing. So I wonder if that was your situation. And then what was it, at what point did you say, okay, now that I have assessed the situation, something is wrong with the way they're handling this. I actually, at the beginning, I was, I had a lot of doubts. Uh, Like we have the data from Italy and China and it was clear that this was not really a virus that was killing a lot of young people. But I sort of went back and forth. And of course I was around, surrounded by so many people who were really hysterical about it. So I would actually go in and out of (laughs) being very scared and thinking, you know what, this isn't being handled the right way. But actually there were a couple turning points for me. One was the New York Times, which was the paper I relied upon, printed an article by David Katz 
saying is the cure worse than the disease. And this was, I believe this was March. It could have been early April. And Thomas Friedman actually reiterated his arguments in a post. And they were arguing that the lockdowns would, especially over the long term, kill more people than the virus. They sort of advocated for a focus protection sort of approach that the Great Barrington Declaration probably have heard of later espoused. Yeah. By April, I was actually pretty certain this was the wrong approach. And then another thing that was a big turning point for me was that I saw that New York Times kept running these pieces in early April about how Sweden was a failure. And I was like, I don't know, like Sweden's taking a long term approach. They're sort of looking at what it will do to society and, and what it will do to people over the long term, you know, in terms of their health, mental health, if we lock down in this way. Can we declare it a failure three weeks in? So I became very suspicious and I started reading, Googling and reading outside of the media that I was used to consuming. Let's talk now, because you identify as being, or at least having been on the left and you move in certain social circles, you know, it's interesting how quickly this sort of ossified into the position that every right-thinking person is supposed to hold. Mm -hmm. Because it looks to be the case that in Sweden, people who would describe themselves as being on the left thought of the approach that they took as being the correct one. And, right. and yet here, and you know what, I was, I was telling you off the air about the guys from Right Said Fred, and at the end of my conversation with them, I asked them, this COVID matter the past 18 months, did it confirm your existing political views or did it challenge them in some way? And they said, well, we're both much more farther left now. Huh. And I thought, well, isn't that a funny thing to say? Because in the U.S., we wouldn't think that way. We would think... Yeah. Because they were telling me how wonderful they thought Ron DeSantis was. Nobody yeah. on the left thinks that. So the terminology is very confusing. But did you suffer socially in any way from this? Oh, in every way. <laughs> I lost almost all my friends. Um, that is horrifying. <laughs> yeah, I, a couple of people stuck by me, and I'm very grateful to them, actually. And they've said things like, we don't always agree with every position you take, but you know, we know you're a good person and we respect your independent thought and you make a lot of really good points and stuff like that. But for the most part, no, they stopped speaking to me. Uh, and oh. one of the accusations I got was that I was aligning myself with right-wingers and, you know, because we're so divided now, that's how people think. Yeah, they can't think, I mean, because every once in a while, you know, the right-wingers, they're wrong on everything. Yeah. I mean, like just today, I, I was looking at Glenn Greenwald saying, yeah. look, this guy over here is a crazy right winger, but man, he's really good on, on the question of war and peace. Yeah. And people are attacking him saying, yeah, but he's a terrible stinking right winger. <laughs> Look, how? Are we, what matters to me is that fewer and fewer people get bombed. I yeah. don't care who's advocating stopping the bomb, you know? Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, I think the political division in, in this country is very, it's very poisonous and it's becoming worse and worse and worse and we're seeing it with the COVID stuff, you know, and the, now the vaccines, the opposite group or the opposite group's position is just painted as evil. And I think it's a very dangerous place to be in. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, you actually have lefty lockdown skeptic in your <laughs> Twitter name. Yeah. I assume you would have been on Twitter before all this broke out. I had not, actually. I oh, you had, oh, Twitter is actually what, got, that actually is what got you on Twitter. Yeah. So I started writing for an organization called AIER, the American Institute for Economic Research, they're sort of a free market research institution, Austrian School of Economics, I suppose one would say. They had been very anti-lockdown from the start. And Jeffrey Tucker, who was the editorial director there, I had been reading his articles. And I just, on a whim, I wrote something and I sent it to him and he published it. So I didn't know anyone else who would publish it. So I, I started to write more for them. And then I actually met Martin Kuhldorf at AIER. He's one of the Great Barrington Declaration co-authors and he and Jeffrey and some other people encouraged me to get on Twitter and start <laughs> start talking. All right, great, great, great. All right, so now you're doing that. Yeah. I'm trying to think of, there's so many things that I want to I want to ask about. I understand how you make a left-wing case against all this stuff. I know how it's done because I've seen it done. And Martin Koldor from Harvard Medical School has yeah. not admitted to me that he's a, left, a lefty, <laughs> but you I think he say. is. <laughs> yeah, but I think he is, and he's made a very good case. I guess, to me, I, I would be wondering, as somebody on the left, I would be wondering why I'm alone on this. Why are the people not seeing what I'm seeing? Why are they not understanding the way this hurts working class people, in particular, when that's supposed to be one of our primary areas of focus? Right. 
well, I've been asking myself that for like 18 months now. <laughs> I think my theory is mainly that because Trump didn't take COVID that seriously, although he, you know, he did stop travel. And so it, he sort of waffled back and forth, but he certainly made a number of statements indicating he didn't think it was that serious. And he's so reviled on the left that I think that prompted a lot of people to say, well, if he thinks it's not that serious, it must be very serious. And he thinks we shouldn't do lockdowns. So we should do lockdowns. And he's not sure about masks. So we should do masks. Right. Yeah. 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 I think that's what happened. It doesn't quite, you know, you have the issue with like Boris Johnson in uh, the UK, who's not by any means left wing. I mean, he's right wing. So that doesn't explain what happened there. I don't know if the Trump effect is sort of worldwide and some people hate Trump yeah. so much. Thing, but yeah, but it's what's really been surprising. And I don't know, when I say surprising, I guess I really mean disappointing. I wish it were more surprising. Is how few, let's say, outspoken celebrity voices there are. I mean, you know, you could think of Van Morrison writing a couple of songs and yeah. Eric Clapton complaining Eric about Clapton, it. But I mean, yeah. the fact that I can name them all is so demoralizing. So in other words, the position of locking people in their houses is just, even though it's never been done, it's suddenly so obvious that absolutely yeah. everybody has to believe in it and not one person yep. can dissent? Yeah, it's really weird. And, you know, the media is just a huge, I mean, if, if anything, it's like the number one problem, in my opinion, the mainstream media, which is not a term I used to use, but <laughs> I do now. I mean, they're really guilty of this. They suppress, you know, other viewpoints. And people like Martin Fuldorf, Jay Bhattacharya, the Sinatra Gupta, the co-authors of the Great Barrington Declaration, they've just been demonized. and often they're censored. I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand why the lockdown narrative persists. And I think it's worth pointing out too that lockdowns aren't, a lot of people are under the misconception that this is what we should do when there's a pandemic. Like that's not true. Other than, you know, in China, there was really no precedent for lockdowns. In 1918, there were not widespread, long-lasting lockdowns. Nothing like there are now. I mean, society couldn't survive because we didn't have technology. Well, that's right. And I think because we can do it, because technically we can do it, that's why we've been doing it. Yeah. Because it can be done, so we might as well do it. Now, let's go back to New York City, because what's happening there is just breaking my heart completely. Yeah. Um, I love New York for a lot of reasons. There have been times in my life when I've really been down in the dumps and just visiting New York and experiencing the energy of the city has revived me and I've gone right back to where, and now I feel like I have to give that up. And it's so sad, but I just can't be part of this. First of all, I've had COVID. I don't need the vaccine. Yeah. The vaccine is entirely downside for me. There is yeah. no upside to it whatsoever. So it makes zero sense for them to be forcing it on me. But even if I did get the vaccine, I still would feel wrong participating in something that hurts other people. There are a lot of reasons people might not, it might not make sense for them to have the vaccine. There are yeah. plenty of reasons for that. Yeah. But at the same time, you have you have plenty of people who would say, and again, I know all these labels get tiresome after a while about whether you're on the left or the right or whatever, but there are people who think of themselves as being in good standing on the left who would say, this is a matter of public health. We're going to keep people safe by forcing them. Yes, it's going to make their lives uncomfortable. That's the point. And then that will help make our society safe. Yeah, there are so many problems with that. <laughs> First of all, from a scientific perspective, the vaccine doesn't appear to be that effective in stopping spreading of the virus. It does appear to be effective in stopping severe symptoms. So people who want the vaccine can get the vaccine and they're going to not have severe symptoms if they get COVID. People who don't want the vaccine don't have to get it for whatever reason. And, you know, whatever happens will happen, but they made their choice. So purely from a scientific perspective, it doesn't make any sense. And then from a public health perspective, it's also terrible policy. People don't want to feel coerced. And this is really, I think it's depleting trust in public health. You know, I think a lot of people would respond much more positively if the CDC or, you know, government was saying things like, you know, the vaccine is, seems to be safe and effective. We obviously haven't tested it over the long term because it hasn't been around long term and neither is COVID. You know, you may have questions about it. Talk to your doctor. You may have medical condition. You may have had COVID. Talk to your doctor. Probably makes sense to get it, but everyone has their own situation. I think people would respond to that and I think more people would get it. But the fact that the government and CDC and all of these other establishments are touting this, everyone must get the vaccine or they're a bad person. I think that's making a lot of people really suspicious. And it's certainly making people suspicious on the other political side. Yeah, I think so. And I think it definitely is going to make people, at least some people, 
dig in their heels and say, now you can absolutely, absolutely. forget it. I just won't visit New York City. And, yeah. and I know that, I know they all think they'll be better off this way. They <laughs> won't, okay? First of all, it's difficult enough to make any kind of profit when you're, first of all, regardless of what city it is, the restaurant business operates on razor thin margins notoriously, even under ideal conditions. Yeah. Now add to that all the panic surrounding COVID, add to that the total collapse in, uh, well, obviously international visitors, which were yeah. used to be very important to New York, but even domestic ones, then you're going to cut off 20, 30, 40% of the people in the city who would ordinarily come see you. I don't see how vendors survive that. I don't think these restaurants are seriously saying, this will be great and healthy for my customers. You, you got to be kidding me. No, I know there are a few that want to do it, but for the most part, they don't. And, you know, another thing that's not getting enough coverage is a lot of people who don't want to get the vaccine are minorities and working class people. A lot of them had COVID earlier on because they were in the kitchen making your takeout, et cetera. And they don't want to get it because they had COVID, understandably, or for various other reasons. And so this is actually having a hugely disproportionate impact on minorities. And uh, my friend Eli Klein, who's very vocal about this on Twitter, made an excellent point, which is, you know, a lot of restaurants in various neighborhoods, say Harlem or something, where a large portion of the people aren't vaccinated. What are they going to do if they're forced by New York City to require vaccine passports? They're going to just, they're going to go out of business. This is very short-sighted. It's myopic thinking in terms of this one thing, which has been the policy all along has been myopic just thinking in terms of COVID without looking at collateral consequences. Right, right. Now, we hear these crazy suggestions. You know, you see a headline in the Atlantic and you think, well, all right, it's the Atlantic. Then these things aren't actually going to happen. But for example, we saw a headline not even a few days ago suggesting that maybe people who are unvaccinated shouldn't be able to fly. <laughs> and now that's probably not going to happen. Yeah. But the idea is that they put in our minds so many dystopian ideas that even if we manage to hold back 80% of them, <laughs> terrible things have still happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's such an uphill battle. You know, in D.C. where I live, they just green state and indoor mask mandates. Everyone, the first day or two, I was hopeful because no one seemed to be following them. And then all of a sudden, it really, there were now that's a $1,000 fine if businesses don't enforce it. And it's just, I mean, we're back to masks for not. You look at the graphs of deaths and hospitalizations. It's nothing. There's no emergency. There's nothing. This is complete, frankly, there's no other word to use for it. It's complete insanity. Yeah, and demoralizing. I mean, I thought about a couple of months ago, it looked like, all right, this is starting to clear up now. Yes, and yeah. maybe I'm obsessing about it because I, yeah. I have a newsletter <laughs> that used to cover a lot of topics. Now it covers only this. And I thought, all right, maybe it's time for me. Maybe I'm like that guy in 1992 who's still talking about communism. You know, like, I mean, maybe it's time for me to move on. And now it's like worse than ever because of all yeah. the, the veiled threats and you don't know what city is going to do what. On the other hand, this is a very useful exercise in reminding us of the powers that exist at the state and local level that there are places that can and will opt out of stuff like this, but yeah. it really accelerates the division in the country because yeah. I'm an avid traveler. So, of course, in terms of international travel, I haven't done as much as I would like recently, but it means that domestically now, I'm going to have to think about which cities I actually <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm going to want to visit. Yeah. So, okay, but now you work in civil liberties. Now, I don't want to implicate any particular organization that you might... You're not with the American Civil Liberties Union, are you? No, I work for the New Civil Liberties Union. It's a small and relatively new, recently founded uh, organization. Are you aware of any statement made by the ACLU about vaccine passports? Because something tells me they're not going to be out <laughs> front and center on this. No, I, I'm not aware of it. I'm pretty sure they haven't said anything about it. They've been a huge disappointment throughout this whole thing. I actually used to donate money to them. And, and at the beginning of the pandemic, I gave them a, most of my, uh, whatever that was, stimulus check, because I was like, well, I'm still getting my paycheck. So this is the right thing to do, because I thought they were the only organization yeah. that would fight this. They did nothing. Pathetic. So I, I went to an organization that I thought might actually do something. And I actually did just file a lawsuit on... Tuesday on behalf of a professor at GMU who has had COVID and is not, does not want to get the vaccine. I read about that. I didn't know you were involved in that. Yeah, that's, I'm the lead attorney on that case. 
Yeah, so he's had it, so it makes no sense on any grounds for him to... Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm sure you already know you've seen, you know, the studies that have been coming out that demonstrate this, the yeah. robustness of natural immunity. Yeah, I actually, we have an app or a declaration attached by Bhattacharya and Kuldorf, two of the Great Barrington Declaration yeah. authors attesting to that. And I also, I, I would like to take the opportunity to briefly address, there was a study that just came out like five minutes before this interview <laughs> that the oh, CDC great. is touting. My favorite kind. Oh, oh, <laughs> yeah. oh, no, is it a bad one? Well, <laughs> so the CDC is touting it. I just want to explain why it is actually, it's not being framed correctly. I, I was on the phone with Dr. Human Norchasm right before to have him talk me through it. So they're saying the title of the MedPage article is the debate is over. If you've had COVID, you're, you're twice as likely to be protected if you get the vaccine. But this is not an accurate framing of the study. Essentially, they compared people who had COVID and then got the vaccine to people who had COVID and didn't get the vaccine. But they didn't, the group that wasn't in it was people who just got the vaccine. So it's still the case that you know, if you've had natural immunity, it's as good or frankly better than most of the vaccines out there. So yeah, okay, it sounds like maybe if you get the vaccine, it gives you a boost. But I mean, we could all get vaccinated every day, you know, <laughs> but it doesn't establish that vaccine immunity is better than natural immunity. And in fact, all the science shows the opposite. Hey, everybody, let's take a quick break to thank our sponsor, Press House Coffee. Just the other day, I saw somebody on social media saying, hey, I actually just bought some of this Press House coffee that Tom Woods keeps talking about, and it is the most delicious coffee I've ever tasted. Told you, that's why it's the official coffee of the Tom Woods Show. The mission of Press House is to make it as easy as possible to enjoy the best cup of coffee you've ever had. And with their all-new Daily Grind, the battle between fresh and convenient is finally over. The Daily Grind is two weeks' worth of Press House's most popular coffees, perfectly portioned, ground, and sealed at peak freshness. No matter how you like to brew or how much you like to brew at a time, rip it, dump it, brew it, that's it. No guesswork, measuring, or noisy grinders necessary. Subscribe, and 10 more pouches will be at your doorstep right before you run out every time. It's time to ditch the K-Cup for a way better cup. Go to PressHouseCoffee.com and click Daily Grind to change the way you coffee for good. And use promo code WOODS at checkout for 20% off your first order. That's PressHouseCoffee.com. I've been getting emails, I mean, I don't even know where to begin with all of them, from so many heartbroken people who have been in such and such profession for 35 years or something, yeah. and they're just being unceremoniously shown the door next month because yeah. they won't get the vaccine and this and that. And they're asking me to help them. Yeah, and I haven't got this. I wish I knew what to say to them or how to advise them. I don't know what to do or say. And I'm sure in your position, you, you must get far more increase I, than I, I do. Get, I get so many. <laughs> um, unfortunately, when it's a private company, your options are really limited. I don't think... The ADA might kick in in certain circumstances, but for the most part, I think that a private company has a lot of leeway with this. If your employer is the government, that's different. And so in our case, GMU, it, we're suing GMU, which is a public university. And so public yeah. universities are subject to constitutional strictures. Right, right, right. Now, I just saw, in fact, let me see if I can type it in and find out. Is it Grant Cardoni, uh, Cardoni Enterprises? I saw an ad saying we are not requiring vaccination uh, for uh, as terms of employment here. Oh, that's great. So, I mean, we need way more of that, yes. <laughs> obviously, <laughs> way more of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I suspect that's what's going to happen is it's going to split into two separate markets. You know, the people who want vaccine yeah. freedom and the people who want vaccine authoritarianism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's simply bizarre because it's just not, doing what people think it's going to do. I think they have this idea in their heads. If, oh, if everyone's vaccinated, COVID's going to go away. We know more and more that that's not the case. That That's yeah. why vaccinated people are getting these infections. Now the infections are, as I mentioned before, significantly less severe, which is why it's good for the vaccinated person. But it doesn't, if you're not vaccinated, it doesn't harm me. I mean, that's what they were saying. In fact, maybe you saw this on Twitter, side-by-side -side videos of Andrew Cuomo. Mid-June, he's saying, the vaccinated have nothing to fear from the unvaccinated. Yeah. And then early August, the unvaccinated have to be banned from society. Well, wait I a know. minute. What did you just say, you bum? So now I realize this is entirely speculative, but I just want to get your thoughts on it. A lot of times, a new government program tends to become entrenched for a variety of reasons. There are interest groups that ossify around it. I mean, you can think of a lot of reasons why once something's implemented, it's much harder to get it repealed 
than it was to get it implemented in the first place. But at the same time, it certainly is the case that in Florida, when we shut down for 15 days, or and then I think another month after that, that did come to an end. So it's not like absolutely nothing ever gets repealed. Yeah. Some things do get repealed. So what I wonder is, do you think that draconian measures like what de Blasio is proposing for New York City might, if for no other reason that they financially harm everybody <laughs> they touch, do you think there's reason to hope that they might be short-lived? I'm not extremely hopeful to be. Uh, DeSantis, I think, has proven himself to be exceptional, um, <laughs> which are words I never thought would come out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah. He seems to be willing to admit error. He actually, unlike the people who tout the line, he actually looks at the science. I speak to Jay Bhattacharya and Martin Fuldorf a lot, and they've consult with DeSantis, and they say they've never met a politician who is so familiar with the science. He's really done his homework. He really gets it. And I think he saw that this was the wrong approach. But most of these other guys, Cuomo, de Blasio, I don't think they, I don't know if they're not that smart or they're too political, but there's been a whole need through this whole thing to really create this other group who's, who's responsible for everything. And, you know, I remember at the beginning, it was, oh, the people who weren't socially distancing and we were, their pictures on social media and let's shame them. And then it was the people who wouldn't wear a mask. It was their fault. And now it's the people who won't get vaccinated. And that's, that's not the science. Uh, unfortunately, this virus is going to be with us. That's just how it works. It's going to mutate. It's going to, the variants are going to happen. And it's not the fault of any of these groups, but there's just been this real need to blame a group. And I think that's what's going on. Yeah. But it's that for some reason, there just seems to be something in the human psyche that latches on to this. It, it takes a perverse pleasure yes. in scapegoating and demonizing people. Yeah, yeah. You know, because you weren't wearing a mask or this or that. I mean, come yeah. on. At this point, it's especially, you know, Ost Michael Osterholm was on CNN the other day, and he's been saying this for a long time, that the masks almost everybody is wearing clearly don't do anything. I mean, how can you not know? How can you be a semi-intelligent person at this point and think that masks have, they might have the tiniest effect, but they obviously, you look at country after country after country, whether it's um, Malaysia or or the Philippines or whatever, they introduce masks on a massive scale and it doesn't do a thing. Like, how do they not see it? But they want to demonize people and an easy way to do that is, you know, if you're, if you're not obviously wearing a mask, they can come after. It's incredible to me. I just can't believe what I'm living through. It is incredible to me. I, I can't either. I, I, Tom, I'm exactly, just exactly the same thing. And when I talk to my friends and family on the left, they just like, their space really believe the masks work. I mean, I think there's a certain segment of the population who doesn't really think about it or doesn't really care. And they just go along. Right. With they just it. do well, what, yeah, what most people are doing. Yeah. Yeah. But in Scandinavia, they're not wearing, it's not just Sweden. In Scandinavia, they're just not wearing masks. Yeah. So they're basically not wearing them. Yeah. And they're doing fine. How is that? That can't be possible then, according to this version of things. No. I, I mean, study after study shows jurisdictions with that. It's beyond obvious at this point. But I yeah. think that the, the left or the whatever progressive side is clinging to this narrative in order to con be able to continue with their, you know, demonization of the group that won't comply with their COVID hysteria, which I like to use the word COVID hysteria. <laughs> I love the word hysteria. <laughs> I absolutely love using the word hysteria <laughs> with them. I came up with, um, inspired by a, a woman in Ohio who does a lot of data analysis on COVID, Catherine Hewig. I came up with the idea, I, I sent you this on Twitter, the, my, my COVID charts quiz. Oh, where, yeah. You know, you compare different states, but I'm not going to tell you which line is which state. But this state did this and this state did that. Which one do you think is which? And you're wrong every time. <laughs> now, it, you shouldn't be wrong every time. And moreover, Sweden, which is a, one of the points I made from the beginning, Sweden and Florida. Sweden and Florida shouldn't be like 5% worse than other places. <laughs> they should be a thousand I'm, times worse if everything that we've endured was justified. And it's nowhere near, nothing even like that. I know, I know. And it might be the case that I, ha I haven't looked at the numbers recently that much, but maybe New York's, I don't even think that's the case. Florida's numbers appear to be better than all of, you know, the, the Northeast, but even if it yeah. wasn't the case or comparable anyway, like comparable. Oh yeah. yeah. Especially age the, adjusted. Yeah. Age yeah. adjusted. Yeah. But even if that wasn't the case, like what people were saying about Sweden, no, it's a catastrophe. More people died. Well, I mean, even if it's a slightly higher fatality rate, isn't it worth something that like, kids are staying in school, mental health, businesses running, because all of these will also have, even if all you care about is life and death, 
this is going to result in more deaths in the long term. We've seen like unprecedented suicides and mental health issues in young people, missed cancer screenings, which are going to result in more people dying of cancer down the road, people losing their businesses. That's going to lead to destitution and depression and all sorts of things. It's it's extremely short-sighted and myopic. I, I don't understand. <laughs> Has any of this changed? And I'll, I'll ask you a similar question that I asked those guys. Has any of this changed your overall outlook on the world? Or do you feel like other people have changed and you've just stayed the same? Oh, no, it's changed my outlook on the world completely. I feel like I'm living in a weird dystopian movie. <laughs> yeah. Like, I didn't think people were capable of this. I thought, you know, people might be seized by panic for a short time, but certainly over the long term, they'd be able to look at the data, the numbers, say, like, okay, this doesn't make sense. That is not happening here, not at all. And something weird is going on. I, I, you know, I have a few friends I text with endlessly and we're just like, what is happening? What is happening? Like, what is going on? And I don't understand it. So it's made me think very differently of humanity, you know, as a whole. Well, I would think also, and I'm not saying this to be in any way condescending, but I would suspect that like most people, you probably went through life assuming that, you know, when the chips are down, the authorities are out there looking for what's best for us and and we should probably give them the benefit of the doubt. I understand why probably most people would be inclined in that direction. Yeah. And this has been, we've just torn off a huge Band-Aid here, oh, you know, yeah. from anybody who, who used to believe that. Absolutely. I mean, I used to think, you know, government had its problems and sometimes it was inefficient and blah, blah, blah. But I thought for the most part, okay, these people like want to do the right thing and they're is somewhat intelligent. And now I think <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Not at all. And for the most part, I mean, it seems to me like less government sounds better. <laughs> well, and incidentally, you know, I appreciate your your good nature about this, but, you know, let, let's be blunt. It, it must have been very difficult to lose friend after friend over something like this. That's yeah. no laughing matter. No, it's it's been very difficult. I mean, it's one reason I moved. I took the opportunity because I was like, you know what? <laughs> Might as well start again. Start but I will fresh, say yeah. I found some amazing people. And weirdly on Twitter, like we've found each other. We started hanging out in New York during the lockdowns when the restaurants were closed and you couldn't really do anything outdoors because it was too cold. And I actually made friends all over the country. So I messaged some of the people in San Francisco who I knew were very anti-lockdown. I was there a few weeks ago and we had a meetup and it was really fun. And we're meeting in Texas this weekend. That's so wonderful. It's, it's been cool in that way. I've met all, and I've met people from different backgrounds and a lot of really free thinkers, which has been really fun. So there has been a silver lining. You know, I've often thought, of course, it's logistically far too difficult, but I've thought about people around the world who've been doing great work, like Nick Hudson of Pan yeah. Data in uh, South Africa, and then Ivor Cummins yeah. all the way in uh, Ireland. And they are just people all over the world who I've gotten to you know, no electronically. Yeah. And I, I just kind of have this idea of someday we're all at some resort talking about how we did the best we could to save the world, you know, yeah. and, and just get to meet each other after this, uh, this ordeal where we, I would not have known any of these people, but I honestly, not that it in any way makes up for what's happened, but yeah. I have really gotten to know some true gems of people, you know, the, the type of people who will stand up and are willing to be unpopular and say the things nobody else will say while everybody else is grandstanding and acting like they're being super courageous by simply yeah. repeating what everybody else is saying. Exactly. That's, that's not particularly courageous. Exactly, yeah. Well, I, I was actually there for the Great Barrington Declaration and we have a plan to when this is over, if it's ever over, <laughs> to meet and have a victory party. So maybe we can coordinate with you. And have a really I love party. the idea of a victory party. <laughs> Honest to goodness, I, I absolutely love that. Well, people can follow you on Twitter at Lefty Lockdowns One. Yeah. Is there any other link you want to share with us? Um, not at the moment, no. I will just say my Twitter handle is kind of stupid because I didn't know anything about Twitter when I signed up and I tried to put Lefty Lockdown Skeptic and it cut it off. And so now it's that. So I've tried to change, I'm worried about changing it. So that's why it's a little weird. <laughs> okay. It looks okay to me. It looks, I'm looking at it right now. As a matter of fact, I just retweeted something you uh, posted the other day because uh, I, I hadn't seen it. By the way, in fact, as we wrap up, let me just read the thing that I just retweeted. You say a lot of people don't want the vaccine because they have natural immunity. Those are disproportionately minorities who caught COVID because they were cooking your takeout. Now they're being banned from public spaces in New York City and other places. You're a bunch of hypocrites, liberal <laughs> white America. Yes, baby. <laughs> yes, beautiful. Beautiful. Just retweeted that to my uh, 
my followers. So oh. anyway, listen, I, I really appreciate uh, you you know, responding to, in effect, a stranger like this and, <laughs> and being willing to have this conversation. But I'm glad we've done it. Me too. And I, I want to make sure people start following you. So thanks so much. Oh, thank you so much, Tom. It was great to talk to you. All right, everybody, before we wrap up, I want to repeat something I've said in the past quite a bit, but I think now it's more and more urgently necessary than ever. The group that I have called the Tom Woods Show Elite is just more necessary than ever. We have conversations where there's no censorship. Nobody has to worry about being quote unquote fact checked by some schmuck. It's all just a free and open discussion among intelligent people. And that is very, very hard to find these days. And we could all, I'm quite sure, benefit from that. So if you would like to be part of the Tom Woods Show Elite, which is my private group, the way to do that is to go to supportinglisteners.com and sign up. You get many other benefits beside the private group, but the private group is, as I say, just so urgently necessary right now to have a whole bunch, thousands of really smart people who can just talk among themselves and not worry that they're going to not be there tomorrow, be disappeared somehow. That does not happen in my group. So check it out, supportinglisteners.com, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.